Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering nutritional problems, nutritional deficiencies. If you guys haven't done so already, please don't forget to like and subscribe below. Don't forget, I'm also now on TikTok and Instagram as well. My handle is still the same, Nexus Nursing. So besides these videos, if you'd like to get some extra practice for NCLEX, ATI, HESI, maybe you have a midterm quiz final coming up, please be sure to check me out on all social media platforms. So guys, without any further ado, well, let me adjust my camera just a little bit. Without any further ado, let's get started. When assessing a patient who's a vegan, which finding may indicate the need for a cobalamin supplementation? One, paresthesias. Two, ecchymosis. Three, dry scaly skin. Or four, gingival swelling. And the correct answer, guys, is one, paresthesias. Um, in the question, they tell you that the patient's a vegan. Well, here's the thing. B12 is not found in plants. And people who are vegan, their diet is plant-based. They do not eat, um, they don't eat meat, but B12 is not found in plants. So a patient who's vegan may be at risk for B12 deficiency. B12, that's their cobalamin, guys. So uh, what symptom What may we expect this patient to have? And the correct answer is A, paresthesia. Patients with B12 deficiencies, they will um, exhibit signs and symptoms of B, uh, anemia, that B12 deficiency, and neurological symptoms such as paresthesia. So A, well, number one, paresthesia, that's the correct answer. A parent with a, a patient with a body mass index of 17 and a low albumin level is being admitted by the nurse. Which assessment finding will the nurse expect to find? One, restlessness. Two, hypertension. Three, pitting edema. Or four, food allergies. And guys, the correct answer is three, pitting edema. How do we know this? Well, in the question, they tell us that the albumin is low. What's albumin? A part of the blood. What part of the blood? The protein part. Albumin is a type of protein, guys. Guess what protein does? Protein is what has that pulling force and it keeps the fluids inside of the vessels instead of leaking out into the tissues. So once that albumin is low, that means the protein is low. Guess what happens? That albumin, which is a type of protein, that albumin that was keeping fluids inside of the vessel, guess what? It's a free for all for the fluids. And all those fluids that are inside of the vessels are now leaking into the tissues. Placing that, risk, patient, placing that patient at risk for dehydration, and at the same time, having pitting edema elsewhere. So the correct answer, answer absolutely is pitting edema. Hey guys, and there's something else that I want to bring to your attention. On the same question, it tells us that the patient's BMI is 17. Well, anything um, less than 18.5 is considered to be underweight. So um, when it comes to nutrition, it's very important for you guys to know about the BMI as well. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Anything less than 18.5 is considered underweight. So this patient is underweight and their albumin uh, level is low. And so I just wanna make sure that you guys understand this. When a patient's albumin level is low, you should expect that this patient possibly has edema because with that albumin level being low, that albumin was what was keeping fluids inside of the vessels and not shifting out into the tissues. All right, next question. Which choice from the hospital menu indicates that the patient has understood the nurse's teaching about choosing a high calorie, high protein food? A, baked fish with applesauce. B, beef noodle soup and canned corn. C, fresh vegetables with yogurt topping. Or D, fried chicken with potatoes and gravy. And the correct answer, guys, is D, fried chicken with potatoes and gravy. Remember, guys, we're looking for high-calorie, high-protein foods. So it being fried, if something is fried, they're being fried in what? Grease. So there's going to be lots of what? Calories in that. Chicken, that's your protein. And gravy, that's high in calories. So that's why that's our answer. Now, let's look at the wrong answer choices. 
A, baked fish with applesauce. Well, the fish that has protein in it, but it's not, it's baked, it's not fried. So we're not getting a lot of calories, right? So um, that's not gonna be our diet that's gonna be high in calories and protein because that's just high in protein because the fish has protein, but it's baked, it's not fried. Uh, B, beef noodle soup and canned corn. Well, soup and anything that's corn, anything that's corn, soup and anything that's canned is high in what? Sodium. Well, we, we're not looking for something high in sodium. We're looking for something that's high in calories and protein. So that's not the answer. Choice C, fresh vegetables with yogurt top, topping. Um, that's very healthy, but that's full of fiber. Um, that's full of dairy. What we're looking for, though, is something that's full of protein and calories. And so that's why D is the correct answer. We have the chicken that's fried. It's fried in that grease, right? So that's going to be high in calories. The chicken is high in protein. And then we have the gravy that's high in calories as well. A patient with protein calorie malnutrition who has had abdominal surgery is receiving parental nutrition. Which assessment information obtained by the nurse is the best indicator that the patient is receiving adequate nutrition? A, blood glucose is 110. B, serum albumin is 3.5. C, fluid INO are balanced. Or D, surgical incision is healing normally. And guys, the correct answer is D, surgical incision is healing normally. Now, if you guys go back to the question, what they're asking is, us is how do we know that they're getting adequate nutrition? Why, you know, what does the adequate nutrition have to do with the wound healing? Protein. What is protein good for? Wound healing. Yeah. When these patients have wounds, that's why we want them to have lots of protein because protein is good for wound healing. Lots of vitamin C. Vitamin C is good for healing as well right? So uh, D is the correct answer. Normal incision is healing normally. A surgical incision is healing normally, right? Great wound healing. That comes from what? Protein. Good nutrition. So that's the correct answer. When using a soft silicone nasogastric tube for enteral feedings, the nurse will need to A, avoid giving the medication through the feeding tube. B, flush the tubing after checking for residual volume. C, administer continuous feeding using an infusion pump, or D, replace the tube every three to five days to avoid mucosal damage. Okay, guys, and the correct answer is B, flush the tubing after checking for residual volumes. And that's a, uh, absolutely the correct answer. Remember, when you're checking for residual volume and you're pulling out that residual, do you throw it out? No you put it back into the patient because you're not trying to throw them into fluid and electrolyte imbalance, right? So you're gonna put it back into the patient, but after that, you're gonna do what? You're gonna flush that tubing because the last thing you want to happen is for that tubing to get clogged. So that's the correct answer. Now let's talk, let's look at the wrong answer choices. A, avoid giving medications through the tubing. Why? Of course you can give medication through the tubing, so that's wrong. C, administer continuous feedings using an infusion pump. Um, this is wrong because you can give intermittent or continuous, so that's not correct. Uh, choice D, replace uh, the tube every three to five days to avoid mucosal damage. Um, actually, here's the thing. If you go back to the question, it says in the question that what type of tubing, what type of tubing are we using? We're using a silicone. NG tube. Okay, if we were using those uh, stiffer uh, polyvinyl tubes, then absolutely we'd have to change it every three to five days. Because why? Because that causes mucosal damage. Absolutely. But look what we're using. We're not using that uh, um, polyvinyl uh, uh, um, type of material. Absolutely not. We're using silicone. That does not cause much um, mucosal damage. So um, it's not as stiff. So changing that tubing three to five days, that's not necessary. So that's why B is the correct answer. A 66-year-old patient has a body mass index of 31 a normal C-reactive protein level, and low transferrin and albumin levels. The nurse will plan patient teaching to increase the patient's intake of foods that are high in A, iron, B, protein, C, calories, or D, carbohydrates. 
And guys, you should all get this answer correct because I already told you the answer. So the correct answer is B, protein. Why? Go back to the question and it says that they have a low what? Transferrin and albumin, al albumin level. Even if you didn't know what the transferrin is, you know what albumin is because I just told you. You know albumin is a type of protein, right? And it says that the albumin is low, which means what? The protein is low. So what are we going to give them? Protein. And by the way, if you didn't know what a uh, transferrin levels is, the transferrin that tells you how much protein stores the patient has. Okay. So when you see the transferrin low, you see the albumin low, what does that really tell you? That protein is low. And so that's what needs to be supplemented. So the, uh, B protein, that's the correct answer. Um, let's look at the wrong answer choices. We have A, iron. Iron is good for the development of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is needed to carry oxygen in where? The blood, specifically which cells? The RBC. So that's what iron is good for. Iron, we need iron for uh, hemoglobin. Um, C, calories, what, is, what are calories good for? Energy. When a patient has a wound or they're sick, they need calories for energy. Energy for what? To help them fight the infection. Yeah. So just like protein is good for wound healing, calories are good for energy. Patient needs energy to fight the infection. Uh, D, carbohydrates. What are carb carbohydrates? Carbs turn into sugar. That's what they break down. They break down into sugar in the body. So B is your correct answer. There's one more thing I want to bring to your attention on this question. Uh, again, BMI. When it comes to nutrition, BMI is very important. You have to understand this. This patient's BMI is 31. BMI above 30 is obese. 30 or higher is obese, and this patient is at 31, so you know that this patient is obese, okay? So um, I wanted you to know that. Oh, one more thing I wanted to bring to your attention in regards to this question. Um, they mentioned um, C-reactive protein level. That's a type of protein as well. But something else I want to bring to your attention, when you see C-reactive protein, or sometimes you'll see it um, labeled as CRP, that also, when that's elevated, that's also um, a sign that there's some possible infection some type of infectious process happening in the body as well. So um, watch out for that. If you ever see that CRP is high, keep that in the back of your mind that there may be some type of infectious process happening with the patient. A patient who's just been started on continuous two feedings of a full strength commercial formula at 100 milliliters per hour using a closed system method has six diarrhea stools the first day. Which action should the nurse plan to take? A, so the infusion rate of the two feeding. B, check gastric residual volumes more frequently. frequently. C, change the enteral feeding system and formula every eight hours. Or D, continue administration, excuse me, discontinue administration of water through the feeding tube. Guys, this is a famous, famous test question when it comes to nutrition. Lots of students, you guys are gonna get a question like this when you first start the nursing program, when you're in about um, fund nation, fund nations, fundamentals or foundations of nursing. Some schools call it nursing process one or two. This is usually where you see this question. So patient just started getting um, uh, uh, two feedings and you notice diarrhea, what's the first thing you're gonna do? The answer is A, slow the rate of infusion. If the patient's getting the infusion too quickly, they're not absorbing those nutrients and that can cause them to have diarrhea, so you're gonna slow the infusion. It's the rate, that is your key, okay? You're gonna slow the rate of the tube feeding. Um, let's look at our wrong answer choices. We have B, check gastric residual volumes more frequently. The volume isn't the process, isn't the uh, problem. That's not, that's not what, I can't speak today, guys, I'm sorry. The volume is not the problem. That's not what's causing the diarrhea. It's the rate, so that's wrong. Uh, choice C, change the enteral feeding system and formula every eight hours. Not necessary, it doesn't need to be changed until it's been 24 hours. They don't have to do it every eight hours, it's every 24 hours, so that's wrong. And then choice D, discontinued administration of water through the feeding tube. Um, are you trying to throw your patient into dehydration? 
No, that patient needs their water. You're going to continue giving that. So that's absolutely false. So the correct answer is A, slow the infusion rate, and that should um, stop or really help with the diarrhea, okay? After eight hours of parental nutrition infusion, the nurse checks a patient's capillary blood glucose level and finds it to be 120. The most appropriate action by the nurse is to one, obtain a venous blood glucose specimen, two, slow the infusion rate of the PN infusion, three, recheck the capillary blood glucose levels in four hours, or four, notify the healthcare provider of the glucose level. And guys, the correct answer is going to be three. You're going to recheck the capillary blood glucose in, floor, it, in four hours. Why? So wait, let me adjust my camera. Why? Your normal blood, your normal blood glucose is 70 to 110, right? This is 120. So yes, it's slightly elevated. But what do we know about these two feedings? They tend to be full of glucose. That's why when the patient's getting them, we're continually sh checking their blood sugar. We expect to see a mild elevation in the blood glucose. We expect to see a mild hyperglycemia. We expect that. And that's what we're seeing. It's 120. Remember, your range is 170 to 110. And you're at 120. So it's a very, very little increase that we expect to see. So what, what are we going to do? We're just going to continue monitoring, okay? Mild um, hyperglycemia is expected. And this is what we're seeing here. A patient who's receiving continuous enteral nutrition through a small bore silicone feeding tube has a CT scan ordered and will have to be placed in a flat position for the scan. Which action by the nurse is best? I'm sorry guys, let me adjust my camera. A, shut the feeding, shut the feeding off 30 to 60 minutes before the scan. B, ask the healthcare provider to reschedule the CT scan. C, connect the feeding tube to continuous suction during the scan. Or D, send the patient to CT scan with oral suction in case of aspiration. And guys, the correct answer is A, you're going to shut the feeding tube off 30 to 60 minutes before the scan. Why? We want to prevent aspiration. Remember, guys, when this patient's on these feeding tube, we're having them sitting up in that bed, right? Why? We want to prevent aspiration. So the fact that for the CT scan, they have to lie down flat, we're going to turn this off a solid 30 to 60 uh, minutes beforehand so they don't aspirate. That is um, our... Um, the biggest complication that we're concerned about at this time. So A is the correct answer. The nurse is performing an admission assessment on a 20-year-old college student who's being admitted for electrolyte disorders of unknown etiology. Which assessment finding is most important to report to the healthcare provider? A, the patient's knuckles are macerated. B, the patient uses laxatives on a daily basis. C, the patient has a history of weight fluctuations. Or D, the patient's serum potassium is 2.9. Okay, guys, and our priority is going to be D, the potassium of 2.9. Uh, potassium has a very narrow therapeutic range. And when I say narrow, I mean very, very narrow. 3.5 to 5. 3.5 to 5. Anything outside of that very narrow range can cause the patient to have what? Dysrhythmias of the heart right? So that is going to be our priority to report to the doctor immediately. Whenever you're asked about what's a priority, you always have to think in the back of your mind, what will kill the patient the fastest? That's going to be our priority. Okay. So choice, choices A, B, and C, those are important, but they don't take priority. Choices A, B, and C lead us to what? Bulimia. This patient's probably bulimic. It's going to have to be addressed, but what's going to kill the patient the fastest? is that potassium of 2.9. So that's going to be the priority. That's what we're going to report immediately. Which of these nursing actions included in the plan of care for a patient who's receiving intermittent tube feedings through a percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy tube may be delegated to an LPN? A, providing skin care to the area around the tube site. B, assessing the patient's nutritional status at least weekly. C, determining the need for addition of water to the feedings. 
Or D, teaching the patient and family how to administer tube feedings. And guys, the only correct answer here is A, providing skin care to the area around the tube site. Whenever you're being questioned about what you can delegate to the LPN, you have to say to yourself, out of these choices, which one is most routine and which one is more stable? Okay, and that's A. Remember, the LPN cannot do anything that, cons that requires to them to eat, E-A-T. Evaluate, assess, teach. Anything that requires evaluation, assessment, or teaching, the RN has to keep that, okay? The RN is always going to keep anything that requires those three, the most unstable patient, the RN is going to take, okay? So A is the correct answer. When preparing to teach an 82-year-old Hispanic patient who lives with an adult daughter about ways to improve nutrition, which action should the nurse take first? A, ask the daughter about the patient's food preferences. B, determine who shops for groceries and prepares the meals. C, question the patient about how many meals per day are eaten. Or D, assure the patient that culturally appropriate foods will be included. Okay, guys, and the correct answer is B, determine who shops for groceries and prepares the meals. So guys, whoever is doing the shopping for the food, Whoever is preparing the food, they're the ones who's going to be in charge of the diet. So that is who we need to be speaking to, guys. So you're going, you know, whenever you guys get a question, you're always going to assess. And remember, assessing is not only doing a physical examination on a patient. Assessment is anything that garners information, whether it's doing a physical exam, whether it's looking through the patient's chart, whether it's asking a question. All of those are assessments. So you're going to be determined who shops. Ask. Who's the person doing the shopping? Who's buying the food? Who's preparing the food? Okay, because that is gonna be the person who's in charge, who's going to be in charge of the diet, who's gonna have that control. So that's what we need to know. So B is the correct answer. How many grams of protein will the nurse recommend to meet the minimum daily requirement for a patient who weighs 145, 145 pounds, which is 66 kilograms? A, 36. B, 53, C, 75, or D, 98? Okay, guys, the correct answer is B, 53. Why? Because a recommendation is about, um, is about 0 0.8 to 1 grams per kilogram. That's what the recommendations are. 0 0.8 grams, 0 0.8 to 1. 0 0.8 is the lowest, one's the highest. About 0 0.8 to 1 grams per kilogram. And it says in the question that the patient weighs 66 kilograms. So you do the 66 times the 0 0.8, that's going to give you 52 point whatever. And the closest number to that is R53. So the correct answer is B. The nurse receives change of shift report about the following four patients. Which patient will the nurse assess first? A, a patient who has a multi, who has malnutrition associated with four plus generalized pitting edema. B, patient whose parental nutrition has 10 mLs of solution left in the bag. C, patient whose gastrostomy tube is plugged after crush medications were given through the tube. Or D, a patient who's receiving continuous enteral feedings and now has new onset crackles throughout the lungs. And the correct answer is D. Remember I told you, whenever you get a priority question, who's priority? Who are you going to report to the doctor first? Who are you going to run to and go see first? You always have to think whose physiological status is being threatened. Who's more likely to die first? Okay, and when I say physiological status, guys, I'm talking about ABCs, vital signs, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, nutrition, fluid and electrolytes, glucose, whatever's physically keeping that patient alive. Now, yes, all of these patients need to be addressed, but none of their lives are in danger at the moment except for D. Look at D. They're getting continuous. It's not even intermittent. They're getting continuous feedings. Patients who are getting continuous feedings, we have to watch for what? Fluid overload. Because when that fluid has nowhere else to go, where's it going to spill into? The lungs. Is there ever supposed to be fluid or food in the lungs? Absolutely not. Okay? So that's our first hit. They're getting, they're getting continuous feedings. 
Now they have ding, 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 new. Guys, whenever you get a test question and they tell you that the patient has a sudden change and that change is not good, that's who you're running to. You hear me? Whenever you get a qu question about a patient that has a sudden change and that change is not for the good, it's for the worst, that is who you're running to. That's who your priority is. New onset crackles. Where in the lungs? Are we ever supposed to have crackles in the lungs? Absolutely not. What does crackles in the lungs tell us? Fluid. Is there supposed to be fluid in the lungs? Absolutely. Look at me in my eyeballs when I tell you this. A patient is never supposed to have fluid in their lungs. Okay? That threatens their physiological integrity. That's who you're running to. That's, they gave us so many hints in this, in this answer choice to make us know that this is who we're running to, okay? We're already worried about the overload because it's continuous. Now they got ding, 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 new onset crackles. Where in the lungs? We're worried about, we're worried about aspiration. We're running to this patient, okay? Next question. Which action should the nurse take first in order to improve calorie and protein intake for a patient who eats only about 50% of each meal because of feeling too tired to eat as much? A, teach a patient about the importance of good nutrition. B, serve multiple small feedings of high calorie, high protein foods. C, obtain an order for enteral feedings of liquid nutritional supplements. Or D, consult with the healthcare provider about prov providing parental nutrition. And guys, the correct, the correct answer is B, serve multiple small feedings of high calorie. Why? They need the energy to fight off the illness and high protein. Why? Protein is good for wound healing, right? And here's the key, small, small but frequent. Guys, it takes effort. It takes energy just to eat. That is an activity. So what are we going to do? We're going to offer small but frequent meals. And in between those meals, we're going to offer nutritious what? Snacks. High calorie snacks in between those meals. Uh, something we've I've been mentioning, I want to make sure you guys understand the difference though, guys. You have enteral and you have parental. I've done... Um, I did about two or three videos on TikTok about this. I don't remember if I did any on YouTube, but let me just explain to you now in case I didn't. So enteral, guys, that's when a patient's getting nutrition via the GI tract. Parental completely bypasses the GI tract. So if a patient's getting nutrition parentally, that nutrition's going directly into the vessels and it's um, bypassing the GI tract, right? Where if a person's getting something enterally, they may be getting it through a, a G tube, going directly to the stomach, has to go get, uh, um, has to go to the liver, right? So that is the difference. Enteral goes through the GI tract, parental bypasses the GI tract. So something very important for you guys to know about that, if a patient has any type of um, obstruction, a GI obstruction, can they get enteral feedings? Absolutely not, because they have a GI obstruction, right? So if a patient has a GI obstruction, they're gonna to have to get what? Parental nutrition. That's important to know, that's a famous test question as well, so just look out for that. Okay guys, and we are down to our last question. The nurse notes that the peripheral parental nutrition bag has only 20 milliliters left and a new PN bag has not yet arrived from the pharmacy. Which intervention is priority? A, monitor the patient's capillary glucose until a new PN bag is hung. B, flush the peripheral line with saline and wait until a new bag is available. C, infuse 5% dextrose in water until a new bag is delivered from pharmacy. Or D, decrease the rate of the current PN infusion to 10 ml per hour until the new bag arrives. And guys, the correct answer is C. You want to infuse 5% dextrose in water until the new PN bag is delivered from the pharmacy. Why? We don't want that patient to go into hypoglycemia. Remember, I told you that um, these feedings that we're give, giving the patient is full of sugar, and we expect to see mild hyperglycemia. The reason we don't want that patient to drop and go into hypoglycemia, guys, if a patient's blood sugar drops too quickly, what can happen? Seizures. 
among other neurological issues, but seizures are the, one of the most concerning, right? And we don't want that uh, blood sugar to drop and we don't want it to drop too quickly. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna add dextrose. What's that sugar? 5% dextrose in water until the new bag comes. That is the correct answer. Now let's look at our wrong answer choices. A, monitor their blood sugar until the new bag comes. So you're just gonna watch this patient's blood sugar drop because that's what you're telling me. That's what you're telling me because we know that if they don't get it, that blood sugar is going to drop. So you just continue monitoring them. You're just going to continue testing them and watch their blood sugar drop and do nothing about it. Does that make any type of sense? Absolutely not. You're not going to do that because you're a good nurse. B, flush the peripheral line with saline. Stop. Pump the brakes. You want to know what happens when you flush that peripheral line with saline? You're going to dilute what they have and make their blood sugar drop. Absolutely not. We're not going to do that because you're a good nurse. Choice D, decrease the rate of uh, the current PN infusion, 10 mLs per... Oh, oh, so we're playing doctor now. That's what we're doing. No, we're not. That's out of your scope of practice. You're not going to do that. But what you can do is add dextrose to that water until that new bag comes, Right? We're going to be safe nurses. Okay, guys. So that's it for nutrition. If you guys enjoyed this video, if, you got, if you'd like to see a part two, if there's anything that I haven't covered that you'd like to see me cover, or maybe I covered it already, but you'd like me to go into more detail, please be sure to drop a comment below. I'll let me know what you think. Let me know what you'd like to see more of. Guys, please help support um, this channel because this is really something that I want to do for you guys full time, but I need your support. So if you haven't done so already, guys, please share my content, share my videos with anyone you know that would be interested in this, anyone that you know they're studying to be a nurse, or maybe someone, a friend of yours is thinking about going to nursing school, but they're not too sure. Share my videos with them, guys. Don't forget, I'm also on TikTok. I have plenty, lots of material on TikTok. Um and Instagram as well. Nexus Nursing is my handle. Guys, thank you so much for uh, spending this time with me and you'll see me on the next video.